everyone fails. If you're not failing, you're not fucking trying. You're not pushing your limits. You learn from it. Okay, what can I learn from it? What good, what do I, am I, what am I doing? Do I not really want this? Is that why I failed at it? Because, you know, half of the time that's the point. You think you want it, but you don't really want it. So then let me rethink, all right, what is it that I really want that I will succeed at? Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Wow. We are in for a spectacular chat. Amy is incredible, the embodiment of change, extremely motivating and empowering. She's a great conversationalist who's absolutely hilarious. Amy has passionate political views and I respect her a lot. We dive into politics for a tiny bit. The podcast itself is non-political and as a whole is all about empowerment, motivation, and love to name a few. These incredible conscious chats tend to focus on the guest, their story, success and challenges, triumphs and failures, and this one is no different. With that being said, I admire her drive and desire for a better world. So I've taken a lot out of this chat and I know you will too. So let's get into it and introduce today's guest. Amy Aquino is an actor who over a 40 plus year career has reoccurred in numerous television series such as Bosch, Glee, Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Being Human, ER, The Practice, Judging Amy, Everybody Loves Raymond, Felicity, The Good Fight, The Mentalist, Brothers and Sisters, Prison Break, Picket Fences, Monk and Freaks and Geeks to name a few. Her films include Working Girl, Moonstruck, Boys on the Side, The Singing Detective, White Oleander, A Lot Like Love, In Good Company, The Lazarus Effect, and Beautiful Boy. Plus, she's also a theatre guru, and all of that is just scratching the surface. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot, such as the beauty of gardens, the need to fix things, picking a career that is worthy of you, making positive change, Jewish lizards, being rejected from Yale three times and taking risks. Also, before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I find it adds a new element and dynamic to these chats. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, so check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. Oh, actually, I was looking at your Instagram and I know that you're a big advocate for gardens and you love them. And I had Diedrich Bader on the podcast maybe a year or two ago. Oh. I, I had a feeling you knew him. I don't know how. And I didn't really get the whole garden thing. And then I spoke to him and he changed my entire life because the way that he spoke about it with enthusiasm and passion and it released something in his soul. I want to know what got you into gardening and what does it do for you? A uh, really good question. So what got me into it was my father was one of 12 children and they had no money and they lived in, um, he was born in 1910. He was a third child and they lived in Brooklyn. And at that time, Brooklyn was a lot of farmland basically. And they had a plot of land and with 12 kids and no money, they had to raise their own food or they would not eat. And they went hungry a lot of the time anyway because oh. you know there's not that much you can grow in the winter time and with 12 kids you know 14 people to feed so he grew up always growing food and um and so then when he moved on and had his own family even though he, he you know he did fine he could support us he always always had um a vegetable garden and you know, and being Italian, we kind of do that anyway. If you go through Brooklyn now, 
you know, which is where, where uh, certainly where in the areas where a lot of Italians and Greeks um, moved, you would always find, even if they have a little tiny bit of land, tomatoes and basil. Oh, that's so, and cute. so, so we always had gardens um, growing up and I always helped him with the gardening. He was my, he was my buddy um, when I was little. And um, so when I got this house and I had yard, I, there was no question in my mind. I didn't even like think twice about it. It's like, all right. So the question was, where am I going to put the vegetable garden? So I, I created a driveway garden. And then over the years, um, you know, which is like that patch of land that you really can't do much with which is on the other side of the driveway. I didn't know it was a thing. Apparently it's a thing. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, it's expanded more and more into basically all of the yard that, that gets enough sun I've got planted with either fruit, trees or vegetables or herbs and and I just I love it I could literally spend all day every day in the Amazing. and it's not okay so here's the thing everybody thinks that gardening is all about nurturing you plant you grow you give it food you give it water you give it light and it's all this lovely thing but the other half of gardening is killing shit you go and you cut off the branches that you don't want and you pull out the weeds and then you pour boiling water into the, the, <laughs> the ants that are eating shit up. So it kind of takes care of everything, the yin and the yang of it all. That is a beautiful take and I love the um, suppressed anger that comes out in the garden. That is beautiful. You can get it all out, man. You take care of it all. You can get it all. So it sounds very, very grounding. Does it change your mood if you're having like a bad day or is it like your happy 100%. place? hundred percent. When I, I first bought this house, I was single and part of the reason I bought it, frankly, part of the reason we bought that hotel in Palm Springs was because the, the yard had been so neglected. And I, you know, and I see this land and I see, oh, we have to plant things. So I, I bought the house and I, you know, I did work on it before I moved in. And then once I moved in, I started working on the yard yeah. Cause it was barren. I mean, the guy, he, it took him two years to sell the house. He bought it exactly the wrong time and sold it exactly the wrong time. And so I had a ton of stuff to do. And, um, so it, and then my, the, I bought it because I was doing a television show, a beautiful show called Brooklyn bridge. And we had gotten picked up, picked up for a second season. So, and I, you know, I was always super careful with money. So I had money in the bank and I was looking for a place in New York and it was ridiculously expensive. And so I bought a place here instead. And I had this big yard and I'm working in the garden and then we got canceled. And I mean, Ooh. like we got canceled like two weeks, two months after I bought the house. <laughs> so oh, I'm looking out in this yard and I'm saying, okay, maybe if I plant some grass, I can get my money back. But but, you know, of course, it wasn't my last job. Um, but it, you know, during those times, because there's a lot of times for actors, obviously, um, when you're not working, even if, you know, when I was a series regular in Bosch, I would only work a couple, you know, a day or two a week. So you have a lot of time and it's just incredibly grounding. It's always there. It's, it's hard for me not to do it. This morning, there were a million things I should have done at the computer and instead I went out and picked blackberries. I think you did the right thing. You no, know, they were going to kind of, they were going to die on the vine and I just needed to do it. Last <laughs> night I, picked, I picked more string beans and sugar snaps and cherry tomatoes. You have your priorities right. So I'm proud of you. That's, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, Thank you. You glossed over something, which is just crazy that, and I've heard this before, but it's hard to really imagine it. And it sounds terrifying. You know, you bought a house and then you, yeah then you, the role doesn't go to plan, which has probably happened a thousand times in your career, but still you bought a house, big financial commitment. It's probably still scary. You think you got this series regular. What was going on in your mind at the time? Well, I was, I was practical enough that I didn't buy the house. I didn't, I, I made sure that the house, uh, that buying the house left me with at least six months of, income uh, of what I would need to live on in the bank. So I, without really understanding how to do it, um, I just made sure that I had a reserve, I had a six month reserve. So I was, I wasn't terrified about that. Um, and I feel confident 
because the market had crashed by then. Um, the guy I bought it from lost money, but I felt like I could make, you know, the improvements I made was I, I could get my money back. I also just, I literally, I immediately went to, all right, how can I fix this? All right, I'm going to deal with it. Cause that's, okay. that's what I am. And that's why I'm an activist, I guess. So when that happened, uh, like my first thought was, well, maybe if I plant some grass in the back, which is barren, um, I can sell it and get my money back. And then the second thought was, well, all right, the upstairs, because it's a, it's an old, it's a 1915 bungalow. It's, it's really cool. And it looks like a pagoda. It's, we got it landmarked as a matter of fact, because it's so oh. interesting looking. Oh, nice. But the upstairs is, it's probably about, I don't know, we have 800, 900 square feet upstairs and just basically one big master bedroom and then a little baby room. And it is a baby room because when they went to repaint it, they found the original wallpaper from 1915 that had little blueberries wow. and fairies and bunnies. So it's this tiny room, but all windows right across from the master and it has a bathroom. And I thought, okay, okay. I've lost my job. Um, if I put in a stairwell from outside and I could put a little kitchenette in the baby room, this would make a very nice apartment. And then I could seal off the end so that I could have the sleeping porch, because there's also a, this cool little sleeping porch in front of either. I could have a sleeping porch or the, the tenant could have the sleeping porch and I'll make this work. I'll make this work. I can get rent from this. That will pay my mortgage. It'll be okay. And then, uh, you know, I got another job and, you know, continue to work for the next 30 years. So, so I'm okay, but. I mean, longer than 30 that's years as well, which is. Uh, well, yeah, I bought it. Well, I bought it 30 years ago. No, I bought it 30 years ago. Oh, exactly 30 years ago, 92. Okay, I've got so many things. So sorry for cutting off. I've already said the sorry word. You're, I love this mentality of just moving forward that some people, may, maybe if that happens, it can really like paralyze you or freeze you. But you're just like, no, I'm going to, not yeah. only were you practical, but you move forward. You actually create, yeah, you're shaking your head. So that would be very important in this industry where the yeses and the nos and the ups and the downs that, yeah, it doesn't bother you. Okay, oh, tell me your secrets. No, it, I mean, it does bother me, but that's, that's the whole point. That's why I was interested in doing this podcast because, you know, I've had, I've had tons of failures, but you you learn from your failures. If you don't have a failure, I mean, the, the worst disservice that parents of my generation and following have done for their kids is not letting them fail and yep. not, you have got to fail as long as you, everyone fails. If you're not failing, you're not fucking trying you're not pushing your limits and you learn from it okay what can i learn from it what could what do i am i what am i doing do i not really want this is that why i failed at it because you know half of the time that's the point you think you want it but you don't really want it so then let me rethink all right what is it that i really want that i will succeed at and or I'm go, or it is something you want, but you're going about it in the wrong way. Or it's something you really want, but you're really not fit for. It, but you're fit for something else entirely. And and I, my my husband and I, he's a financial advisor, but he started in the theater. I got my degree in biology. I became an actress. He got his degree in theater, and he became a financial advisor. <laughs> and <laughs> we would be, it it worked out great because we have all the same friends. The people he hangs out with are not the financial advisors for the most part. Oh, nice. Um, I used to be an accountant, so, so I know the feeling. There you go. So there, you know, we have all these friends in common, but we would go and talk to, we would be invited to talk to like kids who were graduating from acting programs in, um, at USC. And then I went to Yale School of Drama and that's a whole failure story there. Um, and, and I always would say to every class, look, this is a really arbitrary business, this acting thing. You can be the best actor in the world and never have a career. You can be a terrible actor and have a really lucrative career. That is just what it is. So if it is not working for you, and if you're starting to lose your self-esteem, find something else to do that is worthy of you. It's not giving up on acting. It's just redirecting because this fucking acting business is not worthy of you. And that, that's, where, that's what I like that's the mentality because once you're once you're giving up once you feel like they don't want you they don't hire you then you bring that into the room and nobody's gonna hire you yeah they can smell it yeah totally smell it the minute you walk down 
All right, that's my little, that's all the wisdom I've got. No, no, that, yeah, you, you can literally do a TED talk on that. I think I wrote down about, jotted down 20 different points. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but with the worthy aspect, I think that's so important because we constantly change and evaluate our goals. You may have wanted to do the one thing, and then yeah. as we're striving towards it, maybe we achieve it, maybe we don't, or maybe we realize that's not actually what we wanted to do, which is exactly what you said. And especially yeah. when you do something for a while, you might get into acting or accounting and realize you liked an aspect of that job and there's still something else to do. And you just briefly mentioned that in, in your business, an actor, that is a very volatile business. As you said, it's and arbitrary. Arbitrary. Yeah. I always say to kids, if you remember one word from what I'm saying, it's the word arbitrary because my business room. is totally arbitrary. Please yeah. And do. it's, there's so much out of your control. It depends on how people see you. Right. It depends on so many different things. Now it's social media following. I'm just wondering, it seems like from the outset and also speaking to you off air that because you've got so many other hobbies, I know that you, um, you know, we talked about the garden and I know that you're involved as a union officer. You're also an activist. So that stuff, I would imagine, please correct me if I'm wrong, would also keep you grounded and passionate in a sense because you're not just an actor in inverted commas. You've got other things that fulfill you. But through my experience and looking at like friends, when we do the one thing and we identify ourselves as that accountant, you're in for a tough time when things don't go well. Was that, did you do that on purpose or you just realized that there's more to you than just acting? No, I, I, I was always, look, I was pre-med. I got my degree in biology. I, so I always knew I had this left brain and this right brain. And, you know, I ended up going with the right brain thing, which is, you know, the nonlinear thing. I don't know if it was the right choice. Um, my degree was in, was. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I've never questioned it until like about a year ago. I went, hmm, maybe I should have done this other thing because I've always been an activist. And and where I got actually with even with my degree, I realized, you know, by like my junior year, at uh, three years in, that I didn't really need to practice medicine so much as I wanted to change how medicine, medicine was being delivered. Ooh. Um, so, which meant like, more like, you know, public health. So I, even then when I was 21, That's I realized cool. I was about changing, you know, I said at the, at the top, when I see something that's wrong, I want to change it as opposed to just sit and bitch about it. Oh. And Amazing. so I, that's probably what I would have done. I wrote my thesis on breastfeeding and it was about, because at the time, you know, I graduated in 79 and then the mid seventies, there was this whole um, movement to stop the Nestle company from um, promoting infant formula in third world countries, right? Well, and we understood third world countries, it's horrible because they have no clean water. And so they're going to, you know, they don't have the money for it. They don't have clean water. They're watering it down with shitty water and babies are dying. When the fact is, if you just give mom something to eat, you know, she's got the perfect food right there. So they had stopped that by then, but I did my thesis on breastfeeding in developed countries. And I looked at what the, the, uh, what the medical community was saying about the scientific community about the value of breastfeeding in developed countries. And the fact is there was all this evidence out there that it was much better, even in a developed country, even when you could afford the formula, even when you had a clean water supply, it was so much better to breastfeed than to bottle feed. And then I compared that with what was being given to um, new mothers in hospitals. And there was this huge uh, disparity between the two. And I wrote that thesis in a biology for a biology thesis. And my, my, the, the, it was this amazing woman who was my uh, advisor. She loved it. She thought it was great. She actually presented it at a couple of um, meetings and stuff. And then I had other readers who were like, this isn't biology. This is social science. Uh, Why are you, uh? But I, you know, I still got through, I got my little magna, but I, so even from the start, I was, it was always about how to make some kind of a change. And when I was at Yale Drama School, I started a, a, a tenants association and we had a rent strike because they were doing renovations and blah, blah, blah. So, um, and then, and I also, like I, I uh, 
I marched, we, there was a, a strike by the pink collar workers, like the, the basically, they call it pink collar workers, the women who clean, et cetera. And I was on the picket line with them and people in my class were like, you should be doing that. You need to be focusing on your art. Uh. Art doesn't <laughs> exist in a vacuum. <laughs> These are people, they're right here. They need our help. And that's what, you know, and that's what brought me into the, into the union service. Um, I was working on a show on that show on Brooklyn Bridge and, and, you know, it was clear that they were on basically underpaying us and the union wasn't doing anything about it. And I was like, okay, well, I can bitch about this with my friends on set or I can run for office and I can, you know, and I can try to make a change. So, oh. and that ended up being, you know, 20 years of union service. Okay. I've written even more points on the um, breastfeeding. <laughs> My cousin, she's a um, lactation consultant and she's very for, um, yeah, lactation consultant. So she's very for breastfeeding and everything that you're saying and how important it is and about, you know, making that as a clean process as possible and helping people that can't and all of that stuff. It is amazing, especially back in those times where I'm sure like there was no focus on it. I don't even know how to say this. I think it's amazing because you, you said instead of bitching and moaning, but a lot of people, and I, when, but when I say a lot of people, it's, it's me. We can, we complain, we can bitch, we can moan, but we don't tend to do anything about it. But from the get go, you've not only did you do like the one thing you've been doing so many different things. That's a very rare trait. And also to have such confidence at such a young age, I'm very proud of you, but also very confused because especially in those times, it's not exactly seen as, like people don't care. There's no awareness, but you made the awareness for all the different causes. Why? How? Tell me more of your secrets. <laughs> I don't, there's no, there's kind of no secret to it. My, my dad was very about fixing things, recognizing that something is wrong and fixing it. He was not an activist on any level, but on a micro level, he would see a problem and he would like, hmm, analyze it, figure out how to make it we we have a saying my his his name was salvatore and and my husband we call it doing a salaquino when we like <laughs> figure cute. out how to kind of it's a hack basically a hack but it but it was the same mentality which is you see a problem it's not then figure out how to fix it whatever it takes i'm i'm rabid right now because in the States, I don't know you don't see how much you know about our, our um, election system, probably more than most Americans do, because that's been my experience, is that <laughs> people in other countries are far more um, civically uh, aware than we are as Americans. But, you know, we're in this kind of, we're in this weird place right now where we have a Democratic president who is doing amazing things for people, like he has people's backs and then we have um and they we have this slim majority in the senate slim majority in the in the house so there's kind of only so much that they can do and but we've got these midterm elections coming up so we have every every two years there are elections every four uh, four you know every other one you have a president elected so he's got two more years but we're changing over um a bunch of the members of congress and you know the Senate in November, and I keep hearing from when I talk to Democrats because I, I just decided, all right, I, I've not I've been so focused on union politics, and now I'm, I've been out of it for I don't know, ten years, five years, eight years, something like that, and I am um, so I decided, all right, I'm gonna because I gotta fix things, right? So. <laughs> And here is, and I, and I care, I give a shit. I mean, I don't have kids, but I care about the future and I care about this country. It could be so much better than it is. And um, so the midterms, midterms are very, very important because we could, if Democrats gain some more seats, then we can have a lot more, we can do a lot more things. And now I'm sure you've read about the fact that we are, uh, they've decided to, the Supreme Court has abdicated its responsibilities and, and decided that um, they're not going to uphold Roe v. Wade and allow these states to make abortion, not just abortion, birth control. Birth control. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because they're saying that um, there are these states that are saying that uh, personhood begins at fertilization. So something like an IUD that prevents the fertilized egg from implanting is murder. So, um, no, it's in, these people are fucking insane. So I decided, okay, I got to get involved with this. And, but, so I've just started, at, you know, when I meet new people, I talk about it, I talk about midterms, midterms, midterms and they're like, oh, the Democrats go, oh, yeah, we're just so fucked. We're just so fucked. I'm like, no, we're not fucked. We are doing the right thing, and we're doing the thing that 75% of America wants, okay? The Republicans want, literally want to bring, get rid of affordable health care. We have 40 million Americans. 40 million! And they want to get rid of it. Uh -huh. Okay, we actually got an infrastructure bill passed, so that we're actually rebuilding bridges and roads and shit that have been crumbling. They didn't do that. We did it. And we are trying to withhold, you know, uphold reproductive rights. These motherfuckers are trying to make it so that a 13-year-old who gets raped by her uncle has to carry that child. I'm not exaggerating. That's literally what they're saying. So, no, we are going for it in November. That's what we're doing because we are perfectly positioned for it. And they, the media has been horrible. So I've, I've started, uh, I've gotten involved with an organization called the, the Democratic Messaging Pro Project. Because the media, this is interesting. Yeah, um, the depends. Washington Post, the Washington Post, which is a, an extremely progressive um, paper since Jeff Bezos bought it, did a study of all the media, including the progressive media and the right-wing media. And they studied, they, they went through 270,000 articles and they compared um, how Trump was depicted in his, in, during 2020, first 11 months of 2020, how Biden was, was depicted during the first 11 months of 2021. And the media was more favorable to Trump. <laughs> I know that's, that's hilarious. It's uh, a you know this is when Trump was telling people to drink bleach, and this is a time when Biden is passing all this shit, and the Democrats that are it's actually helping people. But the media, it's like when you've got the one kid who's always fucking up and stealing money and hawking your jewelry so they can buy drugs and sell it to the kids in the elementary school, and then you got the other one who's like working at the homeless shelter and gets straight A's. And, and then when that, when the kid, the, when the first kid like doesn't beat up grandma and steal her shit, you say, look at that. Look how good he did. And then when the other one gets a B and five A's, it's like, what happened here? You know, it's just unbelievably critical of the people who are doing what Americans really want. And, you know, you know, Trump was, as Drew likes to say, it was like a fire hose full of shit coming out. It was like, you, you would, one, he would do one thing and then, and you're like, oh my God, he did that. And then three days later, he does something else. It's like, oh my God, look at that. So we've forgotten about the thing from two days before. So anyway, Democratic Messaging Project, we're going to set up billboards in four swing states and get some more fucking Republicans elected because they're doing what people actually want in those states and, and try to turn things around. And it, it's infuriating to me, not infuriating, I won't say that, but it's interesting to me that when I talk to these, when I talk to fellow Democrats, they're just so, oh God, we're so screwed. We're so, no, we're not. No, we're not screwed. That is my attitude. We are great. So we're going to get the fuck out there. What I really admire, and I think it's a role model to all, regardless of the issue, that when you see something, actually do something about it. And what's the quote? Be the change that uh, you'd like to see. Yes. Yeah, be I the think, change you'd like to see. Yeah, and I think that's so important, sort of like giving up. And I also have a question for you because the media, government, there's always something going on. How do you not let it impact you? Because especially the example that you gave with, abortion, for example, and birth control. 
how do you not let that like consume you and take over your day? Because there's always so much horror in the world. It's also a lot of love and light, which I see more of that, but an issue like this, which is obviously very important. How do you not let it consume you and take over? Because I've seen some people, I'm not saying it's you, they let it consume them and destroy them. They don't do anything and they're not able to function properly in the world. But yet you seem to be someone that you're very passionate about your causes, but you can still move forward and live your life and be the best that you can be. That's, that can be very tough, especially with, and there's the push on the pull and people are saying this and this, and you know, it can just be quite overwhelming. Well, I feel very um, secure in my beliefs with regard to this. It's like with climate change. So I'm not, questioning my judgment and then what makes it okay for me is doing something. I mean, the, the antidote to anxiety is action. As long as I'm doing something, you can sit around and, and I just said this today to one of my new neighbors and, you know, she's, she said, I want to send you, we were talking about, um, the Democrats, and I want to send you this article. I said, that's cool, except um, I really want to spend my time on November. So that would do something. I, it, I, I did this uh, fundraiser for this group, Democratic Messaging Project.org, um, with my friend Andy Borowitz. Are you familiar with Andy? He writes for The New Yorker. He's, a, he's hilarious. You should subscribe to him. You, you, you will learn everything you need to know about. Um, about American politics, you'll just, it just slightly skewed. Andy, I went to college with, and he, he created Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Oh. Yeah. Oh, um, one of my so he made, he, I know he made a little bit of money with that. And that was kind of straight out of college. And, and I did a, he, you know, I did a play with him in college and then I did, um, my first TV show was with him. So I was able to reach out and he makes me laugh out loud every day. He posts like a fake news thing with a photo and it's always based on something that actually happened. So I always find out like, okay. Names are the best something. way to learn. I'm convinced. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Kevin McCarthy did something today let, having to do with the board. Let me find out what that actually was, but he's hilarious. And I called him to ask him to do um, this fundraiser for, for DMP with me. And and he did it and he quoted, he spoke in there about, he said, all right, if you're like someone and you care, and I know if you're on this fundraiser, you care. Uh, but if you're spending your day like on 538, you know, which is one of these political websites, just like scrolling, then you're not an activist, you're a pacifist. You're being passive. Just like getting worked up about it is not. So make sure you're an activist, whatever that is. And I, I had this conversation with my brother. He's, he's 80, he holds you now, 81, ain't you? And um, he, 82, very smart and very progressive. Um, and he, you know, he's very concerned about the election. I said, you look in Arizona, that's a swing state. You want to do something about this? Get Mark Kelly reelected. He's a, you know, he, he got in there at a half a term and get him reelected. That'll make an enormous difference. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to waste all this. We know what the issues are. We know what they are. We know what assholes they are. We know how fucking crazy. I mean, they're batshit crazy. Listen, I had respect for the Republican Party. I disagreed, but I had respect for my Republican friends before Trump. And now I'm sorry. No, gone. Sorry. No, done. He's Bat shit crazy. Marjorie Taylor Greene is bat shit crazy by anybody's standards. This is, does not have to do with ideology. This has to do with she's bat shit crazy. She's the one who said that Jewish space lasers. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of Jewish conspiracies. And to be honest, I'm a huge yeah. fan of them. Because I'm just on a side note. I know that you got to listen to this. Because he said, I'm actually a little flattered. <laughs> that they thought that we could do this because as a rule not something we do but also on the like the jewish conspiracies that i think i heard somewhere that um that we're lizards or something like that is that what you're alluding to to mm -hmm. me that's the greatest 
let, let's just let's let's put politics aside. If a Jewish person can be a lizard, that changes the whole world. If you believe someone can be a lizard, then surely you can see there would, there's not just bad, there's good. The whole world would change in your eyes. Magic exists. People can shapeshift. X-Men and Marvel's real. You can use the world for so much positive. It's not just the Jews. But I'm Jewish, just in case someone's shooting it for the first time. Ken, it's, it's, just, oh, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, it can, it's offensive, but I just see this as if you think that's no. happened, then your whole worldview should be expanded it's, in a it's extraordinary. You you really need to subscribe to Andy because he did some of the funniest things with the oh oh the latest thing with her was Marjorie Taylor Greene testifies that um the the Jewish space lasers she was she was abducted by Jewish space lasers on Damage. January sixth on January sixth that's why she wasn't there. So actually, just on that, I wrote this down. Just going from a career side, it sounds like, and I think this is really important that it's when you don't get a role and you probably audition for like 50 or a hundred roles and you might only get the one or maybe you get the role and then it changes it. That can be really, um, I don't know what the word is, but it can kind of destroy your lack of confidence, your lack of who you are. Yeah. Self-esteem. Yeah. But it sounds like given everything that you've just spoken about and how you've got this like put spur where you just want to see change. Does it bother you anymore? Do you care? I care. I, I care less, a little less now because uh, of, at, at my age, I kind of feel like I want to do whatever I want to do. Ooh. So I want to do the things that I want to do. I kind of, I've, I spent a lot of my life like trying to get to the next level and trying to get that thing. And now I realize that my days are numbered. And in um, terms of. Yeah, in terms of age. I mean, I'm 65 and um, still very young. No, I'm perfectly well. Yeah, yeah, but I, but you know, there's like a lot of Alzheimer's in my family, so who knows? And it can just happen. And I want to, we've been, we've both been, but my husband and I have been lucky and, and, turn, and, you know, lucky, fortunate. We worked really fucking hard and we've been, we've always lived way below our means. You know, I'm in the same house for 30 years and the one that I could afford when I was 35 and single. And it, it's, I drive a 15 year old car. I buy my clothes at Marshall's. I, you know, literally don't buy anything that's not on sale. I grow my own food. I go to the farmer's market. I use coupons. I mean, we, so we've saved money. So we have the money and um, so I don't have to worry about that. So I don't have to work for the money. And I've got Medicare now, so doing it to work for the health insurance. Uh, and so I kind of, I don't know how much longer I've got. So I want to make sure I'm just doing stuff that I want to do. Oh, so, okay. That's amazing. And I think that's uh, something that I can definitely take from and the audience can as well. And I'm not sure how to quite phrase this, but when we first get into creative arts, typically, please correct me if I'm wrong. We've got a lot to prove. We, we, we have these amazing goals and we want to be there. We want to be the star yeah. of this. And then it sounds like with age, you still love the craft, but you just see it in a different way. So it sounds like you yeah. had to evaluate or change your view of success and goals along the way. Um, have mm -hmm. you ha actively had to think about that? I, I have. I think I got carried along by inertia um, as much as anything. I remember when I was starting out, I was like, I am not. If I'm not going to be a star, I'm not going to continue doing this. I'm not going to be some, you know, third on the call sheet on some show. There's no point. There's other things I want to do with my life. So what do I end up, you know, I was third on the call sheet on a, on a, on a you know, popular show. And I enjoyed it. And I, yeah, it, it's okay. But it's not, I mean, I went to Harvard. I went to Yale. I had all these very high expectations of myself and um and i realized that you know you just kind of you get carried along with it you get carried along with it so my demands changed my you know my bottom line what do i want what do i need change some and i was questioning it the other day 
a couple weeks ago, I was with a good friend and I said, oh, you know, maybe I just should have gone into public health and some sort of, um, you know, social uh, justice area because that's, I've always been in that. I've always had a big part of me that gets drawn to that. And, and that person said, you know what, rather than questioning that, it's like you've gotten to a place because you're known because of the work I've done, you can use that to promote these other causes. So maybe that was it. And then maybe that was your, your journey. I was like, okay, I'll take that. I'd rather, I'd rather feel good about that than feel shitty about the road that I didn't take. It's, it's, it sounds like, and especially like given with what's going on in the world and America and stuff that um, we feel like we can do more. And obviously you're doing heaps for the causes that you believe in. But it's also interesting when a lady gives you advice like that, because who knows like what the right path is and what we were meant to do, but I'm sure throughout your, exactly. But I'm sure it sounds like you would, you said you were going with inertia, that you were kind of going with the flow. Yeah. That's my, I'm sure like sometimes you didn't follow your gut or whatever. And that happens a gazillion times. But at the end of the day, it put you into this position where you've had a remarkable career and life from what I'm hearing as well. And then you can use that in a way you didn't think that you would um, if you'd gone down that route, for example, like using your, um, yeah. yeah. And I think that's really interesting because I got a few friends who want to like be doctors, for example, and they'll be in their thirties, which it's still not too late to do it, but they can still be a doctor in their own way. I forget what causes and stuff they were going to yeah. be involved with, but I know through my lens, like when I wanted to be an accountant, I saw life very linearly. I had to be doing that. But now with how the world is and there's more opportunities and the opportunities will keep on being presented, we can still do that, but a completely different way. It's just kind of remarkable yes. when we have an open mind, what can come out of it. 100%. Like, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that, that's, that's what's really important. And I think this generation people complain bitterly about millennials because they're like, oh my God. I'm writing about that's one of the and shows. Like, oh my. Yeah. What's that? I'm writing a show about so, that. So this is. Oh my God. I, you should have my husband back on. And <laughs> um, it's, but the fact is, I don't know what it's like to grow up with hearing every day that the world as you know it is going to change, that is going to blow up. It's going to burn up that uh, everybody hates each other, that, you know, you go to school and there could be a gunman that comes in and, and, and you know, certainly in the, in the States, not in Australia, because they fucking figured that out. They only need one school shooting in Australia. And then um, but here we're just going to keep slaughtering children. Um, but I, so I don't know what it's like to grow up that way. And on top of that, you have the parents who never let the kids fail. So it, it's a, it's completely different. And, I, and there's part of what a millennial philosophy is that makes a lot of sense. That was not what, you know, we grew up with, keep working, you keep working, you work at that job. You know, my parents were, my dad worked at, you know, two companies for his entire career. And he worked from when he was 20 years old until he was 58 years old. Wow. Um, you know, so we just had that and that's what people had. And they, you know, they got their insurance and they got their pension and that's what you did. And we, we look back and we say, well, that's, you know, that's crazy. And the millennials are looking at what my generation did and saying, I don't know, were you happy? I don't feel like you were like super happy. It's a different so, shift. Yeah. And you were like saving all this money and it was all about money and buy shit. And I don't need to own a car. I'll just pay somebody, you know, Lift to pick me up, or and I don't need to own a house, um, rent this apartment because then if I want to move someplace else because that'll be more interesting, I'll do that. We we saw it a lot during um, during COVID. We first we rented and then we bought uh, a motor coach, right? An RV, I don't know what you call what do you call them in Australia? The RV is fine, or like camper van oh, or something. Fine. Camper van, yeah. yeah, this is a big fucking camper. Right. <laughs> so, um and, and it was, we saw, and this was the first trip we took was in the summer of 2020. So it was like, it, I packed up that freezer. I had everything in that refrigerator that we needed for two and a half weeks. So I didn't have to go to store. And one of the campgrounds that we stayed at, uh, because we were being super careful about COVID, there were this, there was a young couple in the next camper. They were in a tent and had a car and 
what they were doing was they both had full-time jobs, so they were doing it remotely. So during the week, they would check into a hotel where they had Wi-Fi and they would do their job. And then as soon as Friday came, they got in that car and they drove, you know, 300 miles and they would stay, and they would go into a park, a wow. campground, you know, in a state park, a national park, spend the weekend camping, and then they pack up and they go to another hotel. So they were traveling across the country doing this. And I thought, that is fucking brilliant. It's Amazing. brilliant. Yeah, this is your life. For us and for my, you know, my parents, it was about those two weeks of vacation. You know, you do your work, you do your work, and then you try to stuff it into those two weeks of vacation. And these kids, like, who knows if I've got, you know, <laughs> what I'll, who knows where I'll be, and what the world will be like in six months. I'm going to do it right now. And that's not the craziest thing on earth. I think that, I think it's amazing, and um, I'm also interested, like, because I'm in creative arts. My parents have been amazing, but like, for example, my dad was the typical, exactly what you're talking about. My friends that are in the creative arts, it's just a complete, and it's not a criticism. It's just it wasn't considered. It's like a different consciousness of like seeing the world in a sense. There's pros and cons. It's always been like challenging, not for everyone, but for people not in that world to kind of understand that world where it's not nine to five and you work for the same person and, and happiness. You know, if I ask most of my parents' older friends, or not older friends, but their friends or other people, happiness wasn't really a factor. It's only been talked about now. Yeah. So what I also find really remarkable is, you know, you're a high achieving student. You, you could have gone in the... Um, what to call like your nine to five or worked in that arena, you've gone into creative arts, which especially in those times would have seen as very risky. Was there like pressure from external environments? Did you even care about that? Was it a thought? What was happening there? I, I was, because I got my degree in biology, my parents were comfortable and I was comfortable. I always felt because I knew how crazy it was to try to be an actress and to be to do anything in the creative arts and but i thought i've got a really practical degree and you know from a good institution and so if this doesn't work out then i will do that and i will be happy doing that because i enjoy it i mean i i love i love the natural world it, physics was a little harder for me but but the biology part i loved and uh so that was really really helpful for me having that as a backstop and it really helped my parents too. And then it didn't hurt that my mom was, she kind of a narcissist, but she, she sang opera. Um, she loved being on stage. She loved getting attention. And so the fact that I was getting attention, that she could go to a play and see me in it, she loved it. It was much more fun than going and seeing you operating in an operating theater. So they were, they were very supportive. And I didn't, you know, I didn't ask them for a thing. I got it job in a law firm oh, yeah. $10 an hour in 1979 which was really good so um when I think about it when I think of the minimum wage now they're fighting about you know $15 to bring it up to $15 an hour and I was earning $10 an hour at and night it would be worth a lot more that as well yeah I mean it was I could work three nights a week and and pay my rent in, in oh wow in two weeks in one week so my rent was paid for that anyway so I, the, the degree helped me with that. And, um, but I still wasn't really worried on, I, I was so focused on making, you know, building this career that I wasn't letting myself be particularly happy. I was exhausted. I miss things, you know, my best friend's wedding. I miss because like, maybe I'll get an audition. I got, I've gotten over that over time, but, um, but no, not, no pushback at all. Just total support from my, from my family. 100%. Well, that's awesome right. in that regard. And it's also awesome to hear that you're like change of goals and that you're more in alignment with what you actually want. You said life is short, which it is, and that you're doing things that you want to do, which is really important. And yeah, and I, it's also interesting, like that journey of, um, I'll just use myself as an example. When I left accounting, I had a lot to prove. I want to be a screenwriter. I, I had this path where I was going to be earning half a million dollars, have the nice wife and I've got a lovely girlfriend, but a nice house and you know, the whole works. Um, and then I gave that all up to pursue this. And I, I, I locked myself in a room for like 10 hours a day writing and it was important, but with a bit of, with hindsight, I realized I could have gone about it differently. I had so much to prove, but when I'm 
going th- yeah. when people and me go through that mentality, what are you actually doing it for? You, you're doing it out of like spite or revenge or to prove people wrong. And look, that can help for a small point in your life, but it doesn't sustain you. And I realized that if I want to be vertical or successful or happy or whatever one's definition is, I had to have a life outside of that as well. And I couldn't yeah. just like torture myself. And so it sounds like you also had a bit of a journey with that regard and how you have changed your outlook on things like not being yeah. the serious inverted commas actor. Yeah, I'm not, I was always too distracted to be like the complete, you know, in their actor. Like I said, when I was at Yale drama school, I was walking on picket lines and, and doing, uh, you know, I, I started a, 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 a tenants association. We held a rent st- strike because of what, my landlords who happened to be Yale University were doing. Um, and, I, and I, you know, friends in my class, whom I love, you know, Courtney Vance was in my class. And, and he said, out of total love, he said, you can't, you're getting distracted from the work. You have to, this is your time. You have to focus on the work. And I'm like, no, we don't do this in a vacuum. We're living here. We got to live in the world. But then, you know, if you can focus enough, then you get extraordinary, you know, actors like him. And I don't, I don't think there's a a right and the wrong. I I just know for myself, I was never going to have those blinders on. I I was never going to be able to be that focused and to not notice what was going on around me and then want to make a change. And um, so I kind of gave into that. I had this very naive sense when I first came out of college, I was going to be the brilliant actress on my, but, but I, I literally, I'm so ADD. I can't just focus on that one thing. And I I have friends who, from my class who were really totally happy to between jobs to just putter around. Like I'm going to kill myself. (laughs) I have to find something to do. Yeah. So, and neither one is right. It's not right or wrong. It's just what works for well, you. That is so important because I know like when everyone thinks there's the one path and, you know, speaking to so many amazing people like yourself, every single person has gone a completely different way. Yeah. There's similarities, yeah. but you can't compare yourself. It doesn't make any, like you can pick the good and like, say, oh, I like that yeah. aspect. But if you want to emulate someone, it's not going to work. And it's, it's just this, no. everyone's kind of a teacher and a leader in their own way, but you can't be that person. And so I think it's crucial that you bring up that you know what's best for you. Yeah, you can give advice, but someone following in your exact footsteps might not work for them. And some people can do the lock themselves in the room for 10 hours a day and that might be best for them. And that's all they can do. I mean, that's what they need to do. It's, and that's fine, but that's clearly not who you are. You want to be connecting with other human beings and, yeah. and, and exploring other people. And that's fantastic. And that's helping the world and that's helping these other people along. That's who you are. And then it, it's totally cool. And thank God that there are people who are just so focused that they can just sit in their, in their basement and just fucking write for 12. And then they come up with these masterpieces that the rest of us enjoy. It's, I had that, you know, going to Harvard was interesting because they did not have, they weren't looking for well-rounded people. They were looking for people who were just like passionate, you know, kids for, to, uh, to attend. People who are passionate about whatever. And so we had totally crazy people there, but they were really interesting because um, they, they had already kind of found a passion and attached themselves to it. And it, and then you had, you know, the preppies who were there because their grandfathers and their great grandfathers had been there. But, but the folks that I was hanging out with were really, really interesting, and totally, you know, just everyone. It was a good worldview as well when you surround yourselves with, especially people of passion, whether you like their passion or not. It, like one yeah. of my friends, for example, he's obsessed with stocks. I couldn't care less. But the way that he talks about it and the passion and the joy, and he's probably the only person I know in that arena that genuinely loves it and is not doing it for money. His goal, he wants to be like, and I don't know anything about him, like Warwick Buffett, where he wants to get as much money as possible and he's just going to give it all away. And I genuinely believe it. 
That's his goal. He's trying to make as much money to give away. And he loves it. And it's just like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I like that enthusiasm. On that, you mentioned that you went to Harvard. And then I also, you you alluded to it before that you um, went to Yale and you said it's a whole nother story. I don't know the full story, but I believe that you were rejected two or three times and you still, yeah, please tell me because that's perseverance. That's right. I, my first, so I, I got out of college and I had been doing tons of theater and I moved to New York. I figured New York had waited long enough for <laughs> me to get there. And it turned out that they totally had not. <laughs> they were totally fine and were not interested at all. So I started taking classes because I still hadn't trained at all. And then I saw who was, you know, I looked at, they tried to fix it. Who's getting the jobs? So it was people coming out of Yale and people coming out of Juilliard. So I applied to Yale and Juilliard because this was like Kevin Klein, Meryl Streep, you know, that whole time. Wow. And when I moved there in, in 79 and uh, applied to Yale, applied to Juilliard, the Juilliard audition was like, oh, this is so not for me. Uh, Cause I was, I was too, I was too old. I was already at 23. I Wait, was, that's too old. Did you, was that you feeling that or was that them? That was, you, did you ever see Chorus Line, A Chorus Line? No, there's a great um, song in it about, they say, you know, make you, you know, feel the ocean. Feel, it's, you know, be a bug, whatever. I forgot the words. It just, they were, I was auditioning with like 18 year olds, 17 year olds, because they're, uh, it's not a graduate school program. It's a certificate program. And these kids were just so moldable, et cetera. And I was not, I was like pretty mature and, you know, relatively speaking. And um, so I was not going there, but, and then Yale, I just, I didn't notice, you know, I didn't have any craft. I hadn't studied. So I auditioned the first time, no good. Uh, Kept taking classes. I was taking, you know, acting classes, singing classes, uh dance classes went the second year still trying to get work not getting anything second year got rejected they're not waitlisted just plain no thank you and then i moved to minneapolis minnesota because i had a friend who was from there and he told me that at any given time uh the unemployment rate for actors there was like 50 percent versus 95 percent in new york so much Whoa. better odds 95 percent did you say employment yeah. well on any given day right on any given day because if you're working on a you know on a soap opera you might work a day and then you don't work for three weeks or um so yeah and and everybody's going to new york to be an actor so yeah 95 percent unemployment at, at any given time oh, but in minneapolis yep. Uh, but in Minneapolis, there were a bunch of different theaters, including these union theaters, union houses, equity houses. And there was also going on commercial production. 3M was there, General Mills. Um, so I went out there. My cousin lived there, and she and her husband were super sweet. Let me drive their brand new stick shift car, which I've never driven a stick. And I, I, Finale my way into auditions at the five equity theaters. I got hired in a leading role in one of them. Like right away, oh, nice. I got a commercial agency. I got a commercial. I, I bought myself a $400 car that I found on the side of the road. <laughs> you just and I was it. all settled <laughs> in. Yeah, I was like, it, it had a little problem because once the engine heated up, you know, once you'd driven it and the engine was warm, if you turned it off, you had to wait for it to cool down before you could turn it on again. Oh, Which <laughs> the risk of during the winter, up. no, not blowing up. It just wouldn't turn on. You just had to like wait. It was just like the starter wouldn't. And I wasn't spending money to fix it. So I just found all the drive-throughs that I could, you know. So I, and I would sometimes leave it running and just lock the door <laughs> and run in and do an errand and come back out. Oh, that's amazing. And one time I just had to stop. I was coming back from the theater, and I just had no gas. And it was you know, 11 o'clock at night. So I just pulled into this gas station. I opened the hood right away, started filling gas. I went, it was fucking freezing cold because it's Minnesota. It's in the northern part of the United States. It gets very cold there. And see, in the northern here, it gets really cold. 
I know in the north in Australia, it gets really hot. Yep. Topsy turvy. Yeah, it's very, very cold. So I, I went into the gas station, and just hung out with the guy, kept warm while the car cooled off until I could turn it on. But my These point are the stories. Was, these are the stories that there, there's us. a lot of stories. Oh, and that's yeah. so it was after that. Then I went the show, the contract ended just before the holidays. So I went back to the East Coast. My parents were in, in Philadelphia, which is where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And and I had already applied to Yale again. And so I thought, all right, I'll do the audition and audition. And that's when I got in. When I didn't, you know, it's like I, I know how to do this acting thing. I was doing it. I just got paid to do it for, you know, for four months and I don't need it so much. So of course that's when they, when they actually admitted me. So I went when I was a little older. But it's still very interesting that I know in my life earlier on, if I would have been rejected, we could have, I could have a bad mentality. Oh, it's them, not me. And then if you try again, you put yourself out there, you put your heart on the line and then you get rejected again, you could be like, no, it's not me. And you could go into that ego space or you, you might just yeah. be like, I've tried twice, tried once. Why do I need to do it again? But you still kept on doing it. It's a very rare trait. You just didn't care. Like you knew this is what you wanted to do. I don't know. It's partly inertia maybe. And, and partly I did know that I wanted to do it. I did know you know, it wasn't like I was wasting my youth. I was never the, you know, ingenue. I was always a character actor. So it wasn't going to be a problem for me to start my career later. And I was just so, I so admired so many of the people that were coming out of Yale. And I still wanted to do, be able to work in New York. And I didn't know that, you know, it's going to be a much longer road to hoe if I was going to start in Minneapolis. And I just had no traction in New York. And I knew a way to get traction in New York, which is, a, you know, at that time was where 85% of the theater in America was happening. And I was just thinking theater at that point. Um, that I was going to need something like a Yale. And I'll say, you know, and I knew I needed training. I was getting myself the training. I was just getting it. So it would kind of be a win-win. I would get the training that I knew I needed. And I would have the credentials and the connections of, of the Yale Drama School. They talk about the Yale Mafia, even though I've not really benefited from the Yale Mafia. I've got more jobs in the Harvard Mafia than the Yale Mafia. Hello? Hello? <laughs> well, it's a, another like comment, which is really awesome, is that you know, you've gone your way, your path. It's slightly like different trajectory to what some people might say, like the 17 or 18 year olds going through that way, but you yeah. saw a avenue for you to succeed and you took it without what sounds like any ego attachment, which is really awesome. Just as a comment, I think that's great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I also heard on that, that I think you said you weren't the best in class. You were good, but you weren't the best. And then you took this big, <laughs> you're shaking your head, but you took this big risk and it kind of, open up more pathways for yourself and just going with this theme of like backing yourself. I want to hear this story, but I think that's really cool that you put yourself out there to play this character and go out of perhaps the comfort zone or the norm and allowed yourself to succeed. So the theme that I'm gathering is that you put your ego to the side and you're just doing what's right for you. So tell me about this. Yeah. I'm not sure that that's putting your ego to the side when you're doing what's right for you. That may be actually following your ego. Sure. Um, but you're doing but it in a way for you. Yeah. I'm doing right. And um, I just, I knew I wanted to work with this one woman for our big auditions. I was, I, you know, I would, when I was at Yale, I was, we had wonderful, wonderful women in my class and, um, and they just kept giving me these little character parts and, and I went with it. It's right. Cause it was like, we'll give that to Amy. She can make it fun. Cause I was funny. I knew I was funny going into it. And, uh, and then for my audition pieces, when we graduated, I, I wanted to work with this one woman and in my class, it was great. And then, uh, and I, but I also want to do something kind of urbane. And so I chose, we chose the scene from Agnes of God. And it was because the characters, were good for each of us. I'd play the therapist, you would play Agnes, who's this nun, and they found a dead baby in a room, and I'm the therapist that's 
assigned to her to try to find out what happened. They found this fetus in a, in a um, trash can. But we kind of, we didn't love the play. It felt a little um, overwrought. I don't, you know, we didn't hate the play, but when, the first time we read it, it was like, oh, this is really funny. We just make her really, I make her just totally crazy therapist. It's like, you know, because she smokes during the play and um, she's a little, really neurotic. And then, and, and Kimberly, you know, made, made Agnes kind of a, a little bit um, of a nymphomaniac. So <laughs> totally not the way it was written, but we used the actual words. And when yes. we did it for the class, much of the class was just kind of horrified because <laughs> we're talking, we're literally talking about dead babies. There's literally this whole exchange about the baby that was dead, that was found. And, you know, where did the baby come from? It came from the trash can. No, it came from God. Okay. You know, where did it come from after that? No, oh, it came from God. On. Okay. Before, after God and before the trash can. <laughs> That's the actual line. And I did it for my wonderful um, professor at the time, Andre Belgrader, who just, we just lost to cancer oh, um, a couple of months ago. And he was, he smoked this, the only person I knew who actually used a cigarette holder. And he said, you know, when people were rejecting, he said, what do you mean? How can you do it any other way? This is hilarious. <laughs> so we, you know, Lloyd Richards, the dean of the school was horrified. But we, we just said, just Kimberly and I said, if, yeah, and he's horrified. And we said, you know what? If they don't get this, they don't get us. So there's kind of no point in us working because this is going to be for, to get your agent, to get casting directors, et cetera. There were, you know, 300 people in this theater. And we did it. And my voice was really low because I had been doing two different parts in this little play in the cellar because my friends in my class got hired to do the real show and the, and the rep. So I had to take their place in these little bitty shows, but I'm screaming and yelling and smoking the whole time. So my voice is down here. And it just turns out that Elizabeth Ashley did the show on Broadway. Our voice is down here. And then it only closed on Broadway. And I, I, that didn't even occur to me. Um, I was just concerned that they wouldn't be able to hear me. And my voice teacher worked with us. She said, no, it's fine. We can totally hear you. It's great. Oh, nice. So I come out with a cigarette. <laughs> we just said, oh, Elizabeth Ashley, my voice is down here and I've got the cigarette and I can't light it. You know, it's supposed to come out and take this lighter and light my cigarette. And that's how it starts. Well, the lighter didn't work. And it didn't work. Didn't, so I just was in character. I was like, ah, I came, ah, until I could finally light it. And the audience watching went, oh. <laughs> because nobody did send ups. Nobody did satire. Nothing at that point. You will still find guests and directors talking about, oh my God, you're right, oh God. And they started screaming and stamping their feet and applauding between every line. All I had to do was like move the cigarette and they were, ah! Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it was, it was this extraordinary thing. And the first face I saw when I came off stage was Lloyd Richards, who was our dean. He was like, he didn't know what to do because he was the one who thought it was a terrible idea. And that's when, and, and er, so everything, I just like this huge 180, I went from being good old Amy, we'll give her that little funny part to everybody wants, all the agencies and the casting directors want to talk to me. And I got a job right out of that to work with Bill Irwin at, oh. the, it, at La Jolla. And, and then I got a call and this is my biggest failure of my life. I got a call on my phone at home, I, you know, this is before cell phones, before the internet, from a guy, I said, hi, I work with Saturday Night Live, <gasps> and um, we saw you, and we really were gonna want to have you audition. And I'm like, this is great. So I called my big fancy agents that I'd gotten and told them, okay, that's good. And then I didn't hear from them until a week before the audition. They didn't follow up, they didn't tell me what to do a week before the audition. Wow. Oh, you have an audition for Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's interesting. I don't have 20 minutes of fucking original material, do I? Because you guys didn't fucking take it seriously, did you? I mean, it's not like, okay, it's not, 
all their fault. But if you're my agents and you yeah, know that Saturday Night Live is interested in me, you know, maybe you want to work with me on it. Maybe keep me posted. So I go for I, one week. I have to come up with original material. I, I kind of wrote this one sketch, one or two sketches. And then this friend of mine came in and we did this Tom Stoppard piece. And we felt like such thespians because it was all people doing their 20 minutes that they were doing in, in you know, in, in uh, stand up places. And it's like, oh my God, I just blew the biggest opportunity of my life. And you can imagine if I had, because I love writing stuff, obviously I like to make people laugh and I just don't have the discipline to sit down and write it. So I'm not going to beat myself up. I just don't have that. Being a stand up is very, 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 very hard. Yep. That's for but sure. I could, if I had worked more than five days, um, that, you know, could have completely changed the trajectory of my career. And it was, I've never felt like such a complete asshole coming out of an audition. But I'm still standing. Well, and you've had a spectacular I've career. Not. Who knows what would have happened. But just as a side comment, you took a big risk with the, uh, a dead baby joke is like, obviously, kid, I, it's quite controversial, but if that's the power of comedy to make what you said was hilarious and I wasn't even there. It's always sunny in Philadelphia do a great job with that stuff as well. But <laughs> you saw something which is inverted commas risky. And then you still, you're like, you know what? This is me. I'm going to do it. And that's you backing yourself. So that's a lesson for everyone. You back yeah. yourself because you knew people would know that to you. Yeah. And I, and I do say this to people, to actors with auditions. It's like, there's only one, you don't know how anybody's going to react you trying to to intuit how it's they're going to take it is just a losing but the only person you know that you can make proud and happy is you yep so just do that and if that's not going to be good enough that's a good one maybe you're not good enough <laughs> that's okay uh, but but these people who try to like figure out what are they going to want to see? What do they want to hear from it? No, it's got, it better be coming from you because at the time, I mean, I had it with, with Brooklyn Bridge, which is a show that I loved doing eventually love the family, you know, Peter Friedman, Marion Ross, just, I'm still friends with, with uh, a lot of the people from that show, but I was playing Gary David Goldberg's mom and he had a horrible relationship with his mother. Like on her deathbed, he was already a gazillionaire. She looked at him and said, you, you disappointed me. Oh, because he had quit school and he had run off with the shooks and lived with her before marrying her for 30 years and, you know, raised this beautiful family and very successful. And he was lovely and, and his wife was lovely. But he and his mother, I mean, they just, he couldn't get over it. And so he couldn't write for my character. It was, it was extraordinary. So that's it. I can't, I can't control. If I go on an audition, I may give a kick-ass audition, but I remind somebody of their, you know, ex-wife or their girlfriend and they're, yeah. or they hate themselves and I look like them. So they're not going to like, you just don't know. So the only thing you do is like, try to make yourself happy. That is beautiful advice. Last thing before we go, I just want to, you said that um, the Saturday Night Live is your biggest failure. I'm not in your life, but that sounds like a big call given that, you know, you still, with the time that you had, you still tried and you still did the best that you could within the time that you had. <laughs> For that audition, you mean? Yes. Yeah. It's, is it, do you view it as your biggest failure in life? Is it something that you do think about often or is it something in the front of your mind? Oh, I don't, I don't think about it often. Uh, at all. I, no, I don't dwell on it. That was a long time ago. It was, uh, so it was 80, 87 or something. So I don't dwell on it. Uh, but I learned from it a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> What's that, the little bit? <laughs> you know, try to like, well, you know, I'm, I'm just one of these people that my, the way my mind works, I kind of like the pressure. So I'll, I'll, I'm not the, I'm not the farmer. I'm the hunter. So even when I know I have a deadline, I'll push it and push it until close to the deadline. 
and I'll be working on stuff subconsciously. I know before that, but then I'm going to really? stuff it all in there because there's that energy and there's something about that, that, that works for me. I don't know if I even, if I had had the warning, if I would have had the discipline to like really kind of work on it, work on it and work on it for the months leading up to it, maybe I would have. So I just kind of learned something about myself too. And that, that's, that's, that's an important invaluable. thing with failure. It's just, yeah, you figure it out. Like I said, it may be that you failed because you didn't really want it. So step back and say, oh, I was, you know, I didn't meet, I wasn't truly seriously serious about a relationship until I met my husband. I had, you know, there were lovely men in my life and some of them were very serious about me. And I was like, oh. that was because I did not feel comfortable in myself. I didn't feel secure in myself. And then once I did, it was right after I bought this house and I, I you know, I met Drew. I was like, okay, I don't have to sit here and be like hypercritical. I can like try to see this person and figure it out because that's the point I wanted it. And I, I say this to people all the time. So it's, you, you got to step back from these things and learn. You might learn where you can improve or you can learn something about what, what you really want, why you didn't do it. Well, you know, there's, there's so much to learn from failure. You got to do it. If you're not failing, you're not fucking doing it. You're not doing enough. So before we upload that to your TED talk, we're going to do a very quick rapid fire segment and I'm going to ask some fan questions and we're going to get you on another five times because you're a okay. fountain of knowledge. Um, so these are some of the questions. Actually, I'll start with the one of mine that we spoke about earlier before we started. Why do you like Vegemite? <laughs> I finally, so I came, we, I've been to Melbourne twice. I spent a month in, in Australia and in, in Victoria for working on a, uh, TV pilot, loved it, loved the animals, loved the experience, loved the people. And then my niece lives in Melbourne, thank God. I, so it was this wonderful thing. She's lived there for God, almost 20 years now. So I went back for her wedding uh, about five or six years ago. And, uh, and Drew bought Vegemite just because. And, and I think it was like two years ago, I said, all right, the Vegemite that's in the back of the fridge. <laughs> Can we throw that out now? And it's like, no, 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 I'm going to have it. And of course, it never goes bad because it was never good to begin with. <laughs> That's a great take. You're right. It was never good. And I'm sorry for offending people. That's the most controversial we're going to get on this podcast. Um, <laughs> what, what role do you get most recognized for? Uh, everybody loves Raymond. Peggy. I literally was on the phone today about doing a clinical trial. Um, for Alzheimer's because I have a lot of Alzheimer's in my family and June 11, they're going to be making jam to raise money for Alzheimer's. So check out my social media. Um, but I was on a clinical trial. Um, I was on this call and she got the, like the, the penultimate question after we'd done this memory test and everything else. So what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm an actress. I'm actually, I'm freelance and I'm an actress. And Oh, you're the first actress I've had. I said, yeah, I actually, I actually kind of, do act I actually work um oh really and i told her i told her my name and well, she had my name and said, well er everybody loves raymond everybody loves raymond oh my god we went to the all things when i was young what's your name she looks it up she, are you peggy oh, it's so are you thing. peggy she was <laughs> again i went to tell my family and so she was so excited. I said, it's a good thing we waited until after we did the study because I think we would have completely invalidated the whole thing. She said, you just made my day. I said, you know what? And I consider that such a gift that just by talking to you, I can make your day because a lot of people say that. So it's like, she could say, I hope you don't mind. No, I don't mind. What I just nice made your day. Oh my God. Take. It's a nice take that it's a gift. And also I remember that role very fondly. That was a long time ago and, and people like her and me still yeah. remember it. Kudos to you. Um, favorite role and why? Really hard. Mostly um, stage. Probably I did a show called Sisters Rosenzweig last year. Um, that was lovely. In terms of, in terms of uh, what people would have seen, it was probably Felicity. It was when I played the, her um, therapist on Felicity. Uh, girlfriend Tony loved Cabone. it. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I can. You know, and it, yeah. Oh, that's funny. I love doing that, and in part because it was written for like a really heavy set woman and just a big mess of a woman. So I, um, I didn't. And she was not only heavy set; she was supposed to be a mess of a woman with like cigarette ashes. Okay, because you can be heavy set and stunning, but. In this case, I didn't have to, because this was a time everybody's supposed to be skinny, right? And I just didn't worry about how I looked. And I got to smoke and I wore my glasses instead of my contacts. And so I was totally unselfconscious. And I, the writing was beautiful. And then working with Carrie Russell, I mean, she's just a fucking angel and oh, nice. brilliant actress and, and so stunning to look at and just, you know, to have these scenes. It was that was probably my most fun role. I also loved doing ER because I got to be a doctor and I got to work with doctors and I was interested in that stuff. And it also, a, you know, brilliantly made show, wonderfully directed. And, and I got to do that for years and years. Amazing. You have an icon- iconic role on Curb Enthusiasm. What was it like filming with Larry? So much fun. <laughs> a, didn't have to worry about writers because it is all improvised. Um, you know, they, they, they have a prose description of the scene, but you don't say any words until the camera's rolling. Um, and so, you know, what a great role. So funny. He was, and he was so, he was so interesting considering that his, the whole series is about him being an asshole and people calling him out on being an asshole. When we shot the scene where he, he's at the door and, and he knocks on the door to get the dog back and I open the door and it's, you know, I'm just like, I, I even forget what I said. Every time I'd open the door, he just burst out laughing because I had something <laughs> shitty to say. The carrot. And he said, I just, you know, and I was like, cut. Okay. You know, back to one. It just, he found it. It tickled him to have people tell him he's, you know, to go to hell and go fuck himself. Oh, so that's the dream. Was, I know it was so fun. Whereas Ray, when I, when I was telling, you know, I had the line where I tell him, I'm like right in his face with the, uh, the, the party dress one. And I talk about his big nose and he was, you know, you know, cut. And he was like, wow, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but Larry just, you know, or Larry just found it funny. I had so much fun doing that. Do you, so were you brewing? I know they give you, um i forgot what you said it's called but do they Crows. do you like pre-plan what you're going to say do you have ideas or you in the moment how did it work with your style i didn't have i didn't have a ton i'm pretty comfortable with with um improv not that i've done a lot of it and i did it at school and and i did a little bit of outside of school but uh i wasn't doing a lot of pre-planning no that's it was just kind of alive in the moment if everybody's because they get everybody who can do that and they're pretty much alive um and it's so well written and they would after you've done a couple takes they would identify lines that they wanted in so that they they did want it or and and sometimes they had lines that they had to get in in order to bring them to the next scene so yeah. they would get those but but it was very, I mean, they literally, the camera blocking. So when you first, you know, typically you, you get on set and you will, first thing you do before you're shooting is you walk through it and you figure out your blocking, where you're going so that the cameramen know, the camera operators know where to go. And then when you're camera blocking on Curb Your Enthusiasm, they don't even want you to improvise that. They want you to just say, okay, and now I walk over to to Larry and I, and I recognize him and say hello to him and introduce him to my husband. And then we will walk over to the table here and we will talk about what we're gonna order for dinner. As opposed, so they, they literally don't want you to say a word of what's going to be dialogue until the cameras are rolling. So, it, and it obviously has worked very well for Yes, you. it's my favorite show. Uh, last fan question, favorite thing about working on Bosch? Oh, the, I love being that woman. I love being Grace. I just brought Grace out. I have my wig still. I was telling you, uh, I used it for an audition. Um, I did love Grace. I, she was so, you know, I seem like I'm pretty self-assured, but 
Grace was like a great manager. She was a great complicated person. She was doing it all for the right reasons. Um, and that, that's connected to the other thing I loved about working on that show, you know, besides the great writing and Michael Connelly is a dream and, um, and, you know, people like Jamie is, I uh, just adore and Lance still a friend. And, um, but the other thing was I got to know a lot of people in law enforcement, a lot of women in law enforcement and that, and I had actually been active with her local. That is my station where Grace works is Amy's local station. Oh. It's three miles away. So I, and I had served on a complete a police, um, community police advisory board. I had been in meetings there. I knew the senior lead officer. I mean, I knew these folks, my, the, the former captain who became a, uh, a commander was, was one of my husband's clients for a long time. May still be a client. I don't know. So we were, cause we were both very involved. We, we, Drew and I set up a police drop-in station at, the end of my block, you know, 25 years ago. So it was just this bizarre coincidence that then my character works at the Hollywood station. And I, and so I would get invited to Michael and the production company were super sweet and they would um, treat because we worked there periodically. And we had, anytime we worked at the station, we're shooting exterior, we had to hire actual uh, law enforcement because they don't want extras you know, background people in costume with guns because they become targets. Um, I yeah, that's interesting fucked, way to, I, I know, that. we don't think about it that way, do we? So they would invite us to the, the holiday parties here because they always, they, I was saying that Michael and the production company would um, host, pay for a, a great holiday party for the station. And, and because we lived right here, we would go to them. And so I've made some great friends and through it and developed a tremendous amount of respect for, people who commit their lives to that. And, you know, we know that there's reform that needs to happen. Frankly, LA did a lot of that fucking reform because like the federal government came in and took it over, right? Because we were, it, the, the LAPD was so bad 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And if the rest of the country had done some of the reforms that the LAPD had done, there would be people alive today that are not. So I love the people, there's, they're, you know, going to be lifelong friends. And that was a great, great thing about the show as well you have an amazing life before we go and i ask how people can follow you and keep up to date with you what is the one question i should have asked you what <laughs> the one thing you said you didn't already ask me <laughs> your reaction was the best <laughs> i don't know what you're asking you follow me they how do you follow me? That's a question that you I'll, I'll do that at the end. That's the last question oh, okay, before right. that. Yeah. Uh, the question that you didn't, why do I love dogs so much? Why do I love, I don't know. What do you think about animals? You clearly hate them given all the amazing stories that you told about nurturing them. And off air, you told I, me that you are pretty much like a dog whisperer in a sense that you look after many dogs. I am a dog whisperer. I, I love all dogs. I carry treats in my bag. Um, but I love all animals. I have a very, I see human beings as animals. Do you like cockroaches? Very human animals. That's not an animal, is it? That is a insect. But I do love, I, I just released a monarch butterfly. I raised monarch butterflies. And oh, um, oh, I saw the butterfly video. There is something, okay. There's something about the, the butterfly. You sent a video of the, caterpillar turning into the butterfly and coming out of the cocoon and to actually see it like live in the sense even though it's on video is remarkable yeah. and you know the what is it the analogy or metaphor of like leaving the darkness and coming into light when i saw that video on your socials I'm like wow that is so powerful and profound and that's just a small snippet of what you would see in your garden and that's what really got me excited anyway that's my rant cool Continue. okay all right no i just i i, I had and that was a you know you you asked what i get from it and that was a moment I had this morning that took me out of everything because I had a, a butterfly was born yesterday and I like to give him generally give him two days to for their wings to dry out and get ready to go. But this guy has already moved around. So I went in this morning and I put my hand in there and they always just climb up on your hand. That's so and I brought him outside, but then he jumped off too quick. And so I, so I got to get him back up again and got him up. Very and beautiful. Any other questions or we're okay and we can... Uh, 
I love Australia. I want to go back. I also want to go to New Zealand. I live next to a couple of Kiwis here. Um, other questions? My next job. Who's going to hire me? Would someone please hire me in Australia, please? Well, I'm trying to Preferably create the big industry here. You've got when I can sell some scripts here, we'll we'll get you on board. Please. Okay, good. That's Amazing. all. Because I want just because I want an excuse to come back. Let's Very see Terry cool. And Peter. Um, before we go, how can people follow you and keep up to date with you and check out your cool videos? My cool videos, it's, it's primarily Instagram and it's Aquino underscore Amy. You can learn about composting and gardening and making jam. Uh, June 11th, I'm going to be making jam. We're going to be doing some Instagram live. That will be June 12th or you'll be fast asleep. I guess you have to get up early, uh, but I'll be doing it all day. Shows. Yeah. People and can. you can watch it all day. Yeah. Um, I, I raise, I raise blackberries in my yard and on the longest tip of the end, the longest day of the year, I make blackberry jam and offer it to people who, um, make a donation to Alzheimer's and that is very cool. uh, Alzheimer's research. Cause I have a lot of that in my family and there's a whole lot of people across the globe who do. So check that out. And that that's the best way to follow me, I guess. Twitter, Twitter, Facebook as well. I can upload it in the episode notes. Twitter, yeah, yeah. Uh, Twitter, Twitter, same thing. Aquino underscore Amy and uh, Facebook. It's uh, it's Amy Aquino. I guess. I'll, I'll find them and people can check it out on the episode notes. TikTok, are you on TikTok? Some... I am not. I watch them. It scares, TikTok scares me a lot. Uh, yeah, it gets and it me. sucks me in, man. It sucks me in. An hour oh. later. Man. An hour, yeah. an hour, yeah. three hours later. And it's like, no, but I've got to watch the donkey and the duck. <laughs> they love each other. Their besties. Just one more. Amazing. You are remarkable, motivating, empowering. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to do part 10s in the future. And yeah, I love oh, you. My and pleasure. thank you so much. Come visit Los Angeles. And I mean it. And I actually mean it. Be the change you want to see. Amy is the living embodiment of this. When she sees something in her mind that she feels is wrong, she decides to act and actually do something about it. This is truly a trait to cherish. Although I might not necessarily agree with all of the points, I respect and admire Amy's willingness and desire to make the world a better place. As she says, a lot of us want to bitch and moan, but never make the changes necessary for our highest good. My take is, if you want the world to be a better place, it starts with you. As Tony Gaskin says, don't make excuses, make changes. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 